Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is using an oscilloscope to measure and display current. Our objective is to learn how to indirectly measure and display a plot of current on an oscilloscope using a sensing resistor in Ohm's Law. The lecture operates under the presumption that the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with basic oscilloscope measurement techniques and can measure relative phase shift between two waveforms using an oscilloscope, as illustrated in the Measuring Phase Shift with an Oscilloscope lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. Can you use an oscilloscope to directly measure current? No. No, you cannot. An oscilloscope is not an ammeter in the traditional sense, but rather it is a voltage measurement device that will only display a plot of voltage across an element as a function of time. This being said, voltage, current, and impedance are related quantities via Ohm's law. Perhaps you've heard of it. Given current is voltage over impedance, one can easily calculate the current through an element given the voltage across it and a known impedance. While this technique does induce a bit of error because of some assumptions and simplifications made, it does yield reasonably accurate results and importantly, allows current through an element to be displayed with reference to the voltage across it. As we've learned in previous lectures, relative phase shift between voltage and current is an extremely important property and this technique allows a technician to experimentally obtain this data. Key to measuring and displaying current through an element of interest using an oscilloscope is the addition of a small resistor in series with the element of interest, known as a sensing resistor. Employed in this fashion, an oscilloscope indirectly measures current by measuring the voltage drop across the sensing resistor and uses the sensing resistor resistance as a scaling factor for voltage. As Ohm's law so reliably illustrates, current equals voltage over impedance. Essential to this technique is your understanding of basic series circuit properties. Current through elements in series with one another is the same, and the summation of all voltage rises is equal to the summation of all voltage drops. We'll examine basic properties of series AC circuits in later lectures. However, they're essentially a repeat of basic series DC circuit properties. Consider the following series circuit. Given a source E and a series path consisting of element X and a sensing resistor RS, it can be said that there is a single path for source current through the element and the sensing resistor. Source current equals the current through the element equals current through the sensing resistor. I source equals IX equals IRS. Additionally, it can be said that this series path consisting of two elements is composed of a single voltage rise, our source E, and two drops. One, the voltage drop across our element, Vx, and two, the voltage drop across the sensing resistor, Vrs. Given the summation of all voltage rises is equal to the summation of all voltage drops in a series path, it can be said that the source voltage E equals the voltage drop across our element Vx plus the voltage drop across the sensing resistor. E equals Vx plus Vrs. For this technique to work with a reasonable degree of accuracy, one must choose a sensing resistor with an appropriate magnitude such that it doesn't unduly influence our observations. Regardless, the inclusion of a sensing resistor, no matter how small, will still induce a tiny error. Ordinarily, a sensing resistor with a resistance of, let's say, one-tenth the magnitude of the impedance of the element in question will provide sufficiently accurate results. The smaller you go, the less the sensing resistor will unduly influence the results. For example, if we wanted to measure current through a 100 ohm resistor, Making use of a sensing resistor of, let's say, 5 ohms should give us reasonably accurate results since the sensing resistor's magnitude is only 1 20th the magnitude of the 100 ohm resistor. Sizing a sensing resistor for reactive elements, however, necessitates a bit more thought since the impedance magnitude for reactive elements like capacitors and inductors is a function of frequency. Consider a 120 millihenry inductor subjected to 60 Hz AC. The inductive impedance formula makes it clear that this inductor presents an impedance of approximately 45.2 ohms at an angle of positive 90 degrees. A 5 ohm sensing resistor might be a little too high for this application since 5 ohms is only one ninth of the inductive impedance magnitude at this frequency. Perhaps a 2 or even a 1 ohm sensing resistor might yield better results. If, however, we were tasked to measure current through the same 120 millihenry inductor at not 60 Hz, 
but rather 1.5 kilohertz or 1,500 hertz, our original choice of a 5 ohm sensing resistor might be more than adequate given the inductive impedance formula makes it clear that this inductor now presents an impedance of roughly 1.1 kilo ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. At this much higher frequency, the 5 ohm sensing resistor now only represents less than 1 200th of the impedance magnitude of the inductor. Additionally, one must ensure that the sensing resistor can handle the anticipated current draw. Long story short, do the calculations first. Recall that resistors exhibit no phase shift between voltage and current. That's why one uses a sensing resistor to indirectly measure current through our series circuit rather than a sensing capacitor or a sensing inductor. This fact is extremely advantageous and frees us from any unnecessary additional calculations regarding phase shift. Deploying a sensing resistor to indirectly measure current necessitates a user confront a technical limitation of most oscilloscopes, even the modern ones, head on. Most multi-channel oscilloscopes, unless explicitly designated as one employing isolated channels, reference all channels from ground. This means channel 1 is a plot of voltage with respect to ground, as is channel 2. This implies that the reference lead for both channels, ordinarily the small alligator clip dangling off the probe, is always hooked to ground. This isn't necessarily a deal breaker, however it does necessitate a user be aware of this fact and take the appropriate steps to avoid total, total disaster. We'll examine implications of this in greater detail in later lectures on series AC circuits. However, as a primer on this subject, consider the wrong way to employ a multi-channel oscilloscope in a series circuit consisting of our element of interest and the sensing resistor in series. This is the wrong way to measure voltage across two elements in a series circuit. Channel 1 is measuring voltage across our element of interest with respect to ground. Channel 2, however, is measuring voltage across the sensing resistor, where both terminals of the sensing resistor have been grounded. Given both terminals of the sensing resistor have been placed at the same ground potential, there will be no voltage drop across it. Do not do this. This is the wrong way to measure voltage across two elements in a series circuit using an oscope. I will tie you to a goat and throw you in a hole if I ever see you using an oscope in this fashion. This is the correct way to measure voltage across two elements in a series circuit using an oscope. Channel 1 is measuring voltage across both our element of interest and the sensing resistor with respect to ground. If you think about it, channel 1 is basically measuring the voltage across the whole series circuit, essentially our source voltage. Channel 2, in contrast, is measuring voltage across only the sensing resistor, where only one terminal has been ground referenced. This is where the small error comes in. What if we were to assume the voltage drop across the sensing resistor in comparison to the voltage drop across the element of interest to be negligible? If we have appropriately sized the sensing resistor, this is probably safe enough to assume. Given this assumption, it can be said that all voltage will be dropped across the element of interest. Symbolically, we can represent this assumption as follows. Given our earlier exploration of the voltage rises and drops in this series circuit, showed us that E equals Vx plus Vrs. If we assume the voltage drop across the small sensing resistor is sufficiently minor in comparison to that of the larger element of interest, we can state that the source voltage rise is approximately equal to the voltage drop across the element of interest. While not entirely true, this assumption significantly simplifies the remaining calculations. Let's just go with it. Operating under this assumption, it can be said that all voltage will be dropped across the element of interest, essentially eliminating the sensing resistor from consideration. Using this assumption, the voltage across the element of interest is being measured by channel 1. What is channel 2 measuring? Channel 2 is measuring that tiny, tiny neglected voltage drop across the tiny sensing resistor. Mathematically, we are ignoring it. However, it's still there, and the oscope screen can be appropriately scaled such that this voltage waveform can be displayed and measured. Given current is voltage over impedance, an appropriate scaling factor can be applied to the voltage on channel 2 to arrive at the resultant current. 
Additionally, one can simultaneously display both channels to show the relative phase shift of the voltage across the element of interest and the current through it. This is the principal advantage of this technique and the reason I demand students get good at it. Recall that ammeters and voltmeters customarily limit themselves to the measurement of effective magnitude only and ordinarily do not measure relative phase shift. This technique, however, allows a technician to determine the relative phase shift between voltage and current. Allow me to demonstrate. Consider a 10 microfarad capacitor subjected to sinusoidal AC with the following properties. It has an effective value of 4.1 volts and a frequency of 60 hertz. The capacitive impedance formula shows us this 10 microfarad capacitor would have an impedance of roughly 265.3 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees at 60 hertz. Additionally, Ohm's law shows us that this capacitor would be anticipated to draw roughly 15.7 milliampers of current and current would be expected to lead voltage by 90 degrees. Given these anticipated values, let's see if we can use a small sensing resistor in series with the capacitor to indirectly display current through it using an oscilloscope. Let's make use of a 5 ohm sensing resistor. Think about it, an additional 5 ohm resistor in series with an impedance with a magnitude of 265.3 ohms doesn't really change the total impedance all that much. We could do the calculations, but let's just ignore it. Assuming the current through this series relationship is unaffected by this tiny tiny additional resistance, we can say the current through both the larger capacitor and the smaller sensing resistor is 15.7 milliampers at an angle of positive 90 degrees. This, by the way, won't be true since the total impedance would be slightly different, yet we kept the supply voltage the same, but we're conveniently ignoring this fact. Operating under the assumption that the current is unaffected, Ohm's law shows us the 5 ohm sensing resistor would experience an effective voltage drop of roughly 77.3 millivolts at an angle of 90 degrees across it. This is a super, super tiny voltage drop. However, it's still measurable by the oscope. If we place the voltage across the whole series circuit on channel 1, it might look something like this. Note channel 1's vertical sensitivity is set to 2 volts per division, and the horizontal sensitivity is set to 2.5 milliseconds per division. It looks like the voltage waveform on channel 1 has a peak-to-peak -peak span of roughly 5.8 divisions. You notice a little asymmetric in that the positive half seems to be larger than the negative half, but not by much. Regardless, at a vertical sensitivity of 2 volts per division, this corresponds to a peak-to-peak -peak value of 11.6 volts. If we assume this waveform to be zero-centered, which it obviously isn't, an 11.6 volt peak-to-peak -peak value corresponds to a peak value of 5.8 volts. A 5.8 volt peak value corresponds to an effective value of approximately 4.1 volts. Thus far, we seem to be tracking regarding our desired supply voltage. Looks like the supply voltage is a frequency of 59.8 Hz. This is close enough to our desired frequency of 60 Hz. Let's just go with it. When we display channel 2 simultaneously, also using a vertical sensitivity of 2 volts per division, we are rewarded with what may appear upon casual inspection to be nothing more than a flat line. Is this true? Is there nothing on channel 2? No, far from the truth. Recall channel 2 is measuring an extremely small voltage drop across a small sensing resistor. Only when viewed at the same scale of channel 1 of 2 volts per division does channel 2 appear to be a small ripple. If however we change the vertical sensitivity of channel 2 only, note channel 2 leaps out of the screen and screams, look I'm leading channel 1 just like your calculations demonstrated. All we have to do now is measure it. Note channel 2's vertical sensitivity is now set to 50 millivolts per division. The horizontal sensitivity for both channels remains at 2.5 milliseconds per division. It looks like the voltage on channel 2 has a peak-to-peak -peak span of roughly 4 divisions. At 50 millivolts per division, this corresponds to a peak-to-peak -peak value of 200 millivolts. A 200 millivolt peak-to-peak -peak value corresponds to a peak value of 100 millivolts. A 100 millivolt peak value corresponds to an effective value of approximately 70.7 millivolts.
Recall our earlier calculations suggested we should be experiencing a voltage drop of approximately 77.3 millivolts across the sensing resistor. There is some error, but we're in the ballpark. More to the point, the voltage on channel 2, our indirect representation of current, is clearly leading the voltage on channel 1. By how much? Given channel 2 appears to be leading channel 1 by let's say 1.7 divisions, and our horizontal sensitivity is set to 2.5 milliseconds per division, this corresponds to a forward shift of roughly 4.25 milliseconds. Given a 60 Hz waveform has a period of approximately 16.7 milliseconds, a forward shift of roughly 4.25 milliseconds corresponds to a phase shift of roughly positive 91.6 degrees. We anticipated it to lead by 90 degrees. Our observations are super close to our expectations. Isn't that convenient? The phasor representation of the voltage across channel 2 can therefore be written as 70.7 millivolts at an angle of 91.6 degrees. Now, given we know the sensing resistor to have a resistance of 5 ohms, we can use Ohm's law to demonstrate that the current through it has a phasor value of 14.1 milliamperes at an angle of 91.6 degrees. Our observations are not that far off from our expectations. I will admit that there is some error using this method, however you need to look at the larger picture. What we've done here is to simultaneously display the voltage across a component and the current through it on one screen. Granted we're displaying current through an indirect means that does induce some error, however we are clearly dealing with a capacitive element since channel 2, our indirect means of measuring current, is leading channel 1, our direct means of measuring voltage, by 90 degrees. Additionally, we can get a rough idea of its magnitude and the degree of phase shift. You note the small error springs from several sources. Principally one, our earlier assumption that the inclusion of a small resistor in series doesn't adversely influence the total impedance of our larger element of interest. Two, our assumption that the small voltage drop across the small sensing resistor is also negligible in comparison to the supply voltage. By the way, I'll show you in later lectures on series circuits how an oscilloscope can correct for this tiny error using Kirchhoff's voltage law and automated math functions. 3. The value of the sensing resistor itself. Note we're operating under the dubious assumption that the sensing resistor has a value of exactly 5 ohms. In truth, it might have a value of 4.95 ohms or 5.05 ohms. The point being that a tiny shift in resistance would also shift our calculated current. And finally, four, differences in human interpretation skills. Is it 1.7 divisions or is it really 1.69 divisions? As your lab partner so ably demonstrates, humans come with varying degrees of perceptive and cognitive abilities and can only expect it to be so accurate. It should be noted as we demonstrated in the oscope measurement techniques and measuring phase shift using an oscope lectures available at the Big Bad Tech channel, Modern oscopes often offer cursors and automated measurement utilities designed to assist in precise measurements and eliminate some of these interpretation errors. In summary, there is a lot of mathematical hoops the data on channel 2 needs to jump through to indirectly display current on an oscope. This being said, it's really close to what we expected and I am absolutely overjoyed to have this ability even with its inherent flaws. Part of the reason this technique seems so contrived and unwieldy is all the calculations necessary to make it work. When you get down to it, the final calculation is a conversion from voltage to current using the sensing resistor resistance value as a transfer function. Luckily, some modern oscilloscopes like the Tektronix TBS1032B digital oscope I'm employing for this lecture for demonstrative purposes offer the ability to automatically perform this transfer function. To enable this feature, go to the channel 2 menu. Choose current rather than the default voltage. Note it initially assumes a scale of 250 milliampers per division. This is obviously wrong since our current is anticipated to have an effective value of only 15.7 milliampers. We need to find an appropriate scaling factor for our given 5 ohm sensing resistor. If you think about Ohm's law from the perspective of units, you note an ohm is a volt over an amp. Therefore, a 5 ohm sensing resistor is 5 volts over 1 amp. Or if you flip the transfer function on its head, 1 amp over 5 volts 
or 200 milliampers per volt. When we select the appropriate scaling factor of 200 milliampers per volt, we note channel 2 is now more appropriately vertically scaled to 10 milliampers per division. Is the oscope really directly measuring current? No, no it's not. It's still indirectly measuring current, only it's automatically rescaling the small voltage drop across the 5 ohm sensing resistor using the chosen transfer function. Really, the only way to mess this feature up is to choose the wrong transfer function, which by the way, happens pretty often because folks forget this feature necessitates an appropriate scale. You note other scales are available, including 1 amp per volt for 1 ohm sensing resistors, 2 amps per volt for 0.5 ohm sensing resistors, and so on. You note using this new vertical sensitivity, channel 2 is a peak value of 2 divisions high, where each division is now 10 milliampers. This corresponds to a peak value of 20 milliampers. A peak value of 20 milliampers corresponds to an effective value of approximately 14.1 milliampers as we obtained previously. Note, current still leads voltage by a relative 90 degrees. In summary, the ability to rescale channel 2's voltage input as current with a specified transfer function takes at least one tedious calculation out of the picture. While not an absolute necessity, this feature sure is handy. Here's the same technique applied to a 560 ohm resistor. Let's again employ a 5 ohm sensing resistor. The source voltage waveform displayed on channel 1 shows it to have the following properties. Note channel 1's vertical sensitivity is set to 2 volts per division, and the horizontal sensitivity is set to 2.5 milliseconds per division. It looks like the source has a peak-to-peak -peak span of let's say 7 divisions. Again, you'll notice a little asymmetric in that the positive half seems to be larger than the negative half, but not by much. Regardless, at 2 volts per division, this corresponds to a peak-to-peak -peak value of 14 volts. If we assume this waveform to be zero-centered, which it obviously isn't, a 14-volt peak-to-peak value would correspond to a peak value of 7 volts. A 7-volt peak value would correspond to an effective value of approximately 4.9 volts. Looks like the supply voltage has a frequency of 79.9 Hz, almost 80 Hz. Assuming the source voltage is our reference, given the above data, it can be said that the phasor representation of voltage across the resistor is 4.9 volts at an angle of 0 degrees. Ohm's law shows us that the current drawn by the 560 ohm resistor should be roughly 8.8 .8 milliampers at an angle of 0 degrees. Let's see if this is the case. When we display channel 2 adjusted to compensate for a 5 ohm sensing resistor using a 200 milliampers per volt transfer function, we are rewarded with the following display. Note channel 2's vertical sensitivity is set to 4 milliampers per division, and the horizontal sensitivity for both channels is still set to 2.5 milliseconds per division. The two waveforms are obviously in phase with one another, in that the direct means of measuring and displaying voltage across the resistor, channel 1, simultaneously peaks and valleys with the indirect means of measuring and displaying current through the resistor, channel 2, indicating that our resistor is obviously wholly resistive in nature. This is the larger take-home point. There exists no relative phase shift between the voltage and current for this resistive element. This being said, we can still make magnitude measurements of the current waveform with the understanding that there might be some inherent inaccuracies. It looks like the indirectly measured current waveform has a peak-to-peak -peak span of let's say 6.2 divisions. You note it's a little asymmetric and that the positive half seems to be larger than the negative half, but not by much. Regardless, at 2 volts per division, this corresponds to a peak-to-peak -peak value of 24.8 milliampers. Again, note, because we're using the automated transfer function, channel 2 is measuring current. If we assume this waveform to be zero-centered, which it obviously isn't, a 24.8 milliampere peak to peak value corresponds to a peak value of 12.4 milliampers. 12.4 milliampere peak value corresponds to an effective value of approximately 8.8 .8 milliampers. Given there is no phase shift between voltage and current, it can be said that the phasor representation of our current through the resistor is 8.8 .8 milliampers at an angle of 0 degrees, exactly in agreement with our previous calculations. That is impressive. Only very rarely does it work out this well. I think I'm going to take the rest of this lecture off and let you do the work from here on. Let's make this an exercise that necessitates active involvement on your part in the form of a mystery. Let's say we set up a 5 ohm sensing resistor in series with a mystery element in the following fashion. 
Channel 1 is measuring the voltage across the entire series circuit. Channel 2 is measuring the voltage drop only across the sensing resistor. Let's say we're safe in assuming that the inclusion of the sensing resistor in series doesn't adversely influence the total impedance of our larger mystery element, now that the small voltage drop across the small sensing resistor is also negligible in comparison to the supply voltage. If we show channel 1 the source voltage on the oscilloscope using a vertical sensitivity of 2 volts per division and a horizontal sensitivity of 100 microseconds per division, we are rewarded with the following display. See if you can determine the peak to peak value, the peak value, the effective value, the frequency, and the period of this voltage waveform. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following results. It looks like the source voltage on channel 1 has a peak to peak span of roughly 7.6 divisions. You note it's a little asymmetric and the positive half seems to be larger than the negative half, but not by much. Regardless, at 2 volts per division, this corresponds to a peak to peak value of roughly 15.2 volts. If we assume this waveform to be zero centered, which it obviously isn't, a 15.2 volt peak to peak value corresponds to a peak value of 7.6 volts. A 7.6 volt peak value corresponds to an effective value of approximately 5.4 volts. The oscilloscope is displaying a frequency of 1500.7 Hz in the lower right hand corner. If we wanted to confirm the accuracy of this automated measurement, one can manually measure the period. It looks like the two zero crossings going positive are separated by roughly 6.6, 6.7-ish divisions. Let's say 6.65 divisions. At the given horizontal sensitivity of 100 microseconds per division, this corresponds to a period of 665 microseconds. If we invert this measured period, we find this corresponds to a frequency of 1503.8 Hz, extremely close to the automatically displayed frequency of 1500.7 Hz. Let's just go with the automatically displayed value of 1500.7 Hz. This corresponds to a period of 666.4 microseconds. Given the above information, if we were to represent the source voltage displayed on channel 1 as a phasor equivalent, it would be equal to 5.4 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, assuming this is our reference. Now, let's display channel 2 on the oscilloscope using the same vertical sensitivity as channel 1 of 2 volts per division. Doing so rewards us with a fuzzy blue line that yields little usable data. What's wrong? Is there really no voltage drop across the sensing resistor? By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. What would you do to convince channel 2 to share some of its secrets? If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following solution. There is a voltage drop across the sensing resistor, only it's extremely small in comparison to the voltage displayed on channel 1. Only when viewed at the same scale as channel 1 does channel 2 appear to be a flat, fuzzy line. We need to change the vertical sensitivity of channel 2 only. If channel 2 is viewed using a more appropriate vertical sensitivity of 10 millivolts per division, a sinusoidal waveform appears with some pretty measurable properties. Before diving into these details, answer me this simple question. Given the voltage on channel 2 is an indirect means of measuring and displaying current through the element in question, and the voltage waveform on channel 1 is the voltage across it, what type of element is this unknown element? Is it a resistor? a capacitor, or an inductor. You should be able to recall very memorable relations regarding voltage and current for these basic elements. By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following answer. Recall that current is in phase with the voltage across purely resistive elements. Current leads the voltage across purely capacitive elements by 90 degrees. And finally, current lags the voltage across purely inductive elements by 90 degrees. Given these facts and this observation, this unknown element is undoubtedly primarily inductive in nature, given channel 2, our indirect means of measuring and displaying current through the element in question, is clearly lagging channel 1, or more direct means of measuring and displaying voltage across the element in question. Is it lagging by exactly 90 degrees? I don't know. We'll have to measure it to be certain. This being said, current is clearly lagging voltage and we're obviously dealing with a largely inductive element. That's the larger point of this technique. Let's now make some precise measurements of the voltage waveform displayed on channel 2.
You'll note we're not using the automated transfer function utility for channel two for this exercise. It's still being displayed as voltage. See if you can determine the peak to peak value, the peak value, and the effective value of the voltage waveform on channel two. Additionally, see if you can determine the relative phase shift between the two waveforms given the voltage waveform on channel one is assumed to be our reference. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following results. It looks like the voltage waveform on channel two has a peak to peak span of roughly 4.4 divisions. At a vertical sensitivity of 10 millivolts per division, this corresponds to a peak to peak value of roughly 44 millivolts. 44 millivolt peak to peak value would correspond to a peak value of 22 millivolts. A 22 millivolt peak value would correspond to an effective value of approximately 15.5 millivolts. It looks like the voltage waveform on channel two is lagging the waveform on channel one by let's say 1.5 divisions. Given the horizontal sensitivity is set to 100 microseconds per division, this corresponds to a backward shift of roughly 150 microseconds. Given this 1,500 hertz waveform has a period of approximately 666.4 microseconds, a backward shift of 150 microseconds corresponds to a phase shift of roughly negative 81 degrees. It's not lagging by a perfect 90 degrees. However, we are clearly favoring the inductive end of the spectrum. Given the above information, if we were to represent the voltage across the sensing resistor displayed on channel two as a phasor equivalent, it would be equal to 15.5 millivolts at an angle of negative 81 degrees. Now, given channel two is in actuality the voltage drop across a five ohm sensing resistor, see if you can use Ohm's law to determine the current through it as a phasor equivalent. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following result. Ohm's law shows us that the current through the five ohm sensing resistor is the voltage phasor of 15.5 millivolts at an angle of negative 81 degrees over the complex impedance of five ohms at an angle of zero degrees. The calculation yields a current of roughly 3.1 milliamperes at an angle of negative 81 degrees. If we wanted to, we could use the same scaling factor to derive other properties for the indirect means of measuring and displaying current. However, we got what we need. We know the phasor equivalent voltage across the unknown element and the phasor equivalent of current through it. Now, see if we can use Ohm's law to determine the impedance of the unknown element and the components, note the plural, components, that comprise this impedance. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have arrived at the following results. Impedance is equal to voltage over current. Substituting our given values, impedance appears to be approximately 1,727.3 ohms at an angle of 81 degrees, or roughly 1.7 kilo ohms at an angle of 81 degrees, supporting our earlier hypothesis that this impedance is largely inductive. If this impedance was purely inductive, we'd be able to directly solve for the component level value of the inductor satisfying this condition, However, since it's only largely inductive in nature, this necessitates another intermediary step. We need to resolve this impedance represented as a magnitude and direction using polar format into real and reactive components using rectangular format. Doing so, we find 1727.3 ohms at an angle of 81 degrees in polar format to be equivalent to 269.1 plus J 1706.2 using rectangular format. Given the real portion is the resistive element and the imaginary component is the reactive inductive portion, we need to determine the components that would satisfy this condition at the given frequency. A 269.1 ohm resistor would satisfy the real component condition. Solving for the element satisfying the imaginary component condition necessitates a bit more work. Given the imaginary component is clearly inductive, we can rearrange the inductive impedance formula to solve for inductance and substitute in our given magnitude and frequency values. Doing so yields an inductance value of roughly 180 millihenries. We can be certain that our unknown impedance is a 269.1 ohm resistor in series with 180 millihenry inductor at 1,500 hertz. When we crack open the mystery box, we are astonished to find that this isn't exactly true because the circuit in question actually contains only a 200 ohm resistor in series with a 180 millihenry inductor. What's the deal? Has Ohm's law been proven wrong? Far from the truth. 
note that real-world components include small deviations from ideal behavior. Inductors, since they're composed of coils of wire, sometimes contain a measurable amount of internal resistance that can be modeled as a small internal resistance in series with the reactive portion. Most likely, this is a 180 millihenry inductor that happens to have an internal resistance component of approximately 69.1 ohms in series with the 180 millihenry inductive portion. Given the 200 ohm resistors in series with the 180 millihenry inductor with a 69.1 ohm internal resistance, this makes it appear as if the whole impedance is equal to 1727.3 ohms at an angle of 81 degrees using polar format, or 269.1 plus J1706.2 using rectangular format. Problem solved, all thanks to the oscope's ability to indirectly display current through an element relative to the voltage across it. If you wanted to, you could also make use of the oscope's ability to automatically rescale voltage as current using an appropriate transfer function. Here's a screenshot of channel 2 making use of a 200 milliampere per volt transfer function appropriate for a 5 ohm sensing resistor. You note all our previous values we obtained are still accurate, only using this automated means we could skip the conversion of voltage to current using the sensing resistor resistance. Not all oscopes have this ability, nor is it mandatory. However, it sure is convenient. Before we bring this lecture to a close, let's perform an objective review of that last example problem. While I did progressively lead you through the steps by your nose, note I never asked you to perform a calculation we haven't done so already. That's the point. We really only added one new technique to our repertoire, notably using a sensing resistor and an oscope to indirectly measure current through an unknown element. Everything else necessitated your prior understanding of Ohm's law, phasor representation, complex impedance, and basic sinusoidal properties, techniques we've already discussed at some length. Be honest. Did you understand everything we discussed? At risk of repeating myself, if you struggled with any aspect of the above exercise, your issue may not necessarily be rooted in your misunderstanding of using an oscope and sensing resistor to indirectly measure and display current per se, but rather in your inability to use Ohm's law phasor representation, complex impedances, and basic sinusoidal properties to their full effect. If you lack confidence in these aforementioned skills, I again direct your attention to these previous lectures and ask that you bring yourself up to speed because we are moving on with or without you. All right, that's about it for current measurement using an oscope. In conclusion, this lecture examined the means of indirectly measuring and displaying current on an oscope using a small sensing resistor in series with an element of interest. While this technique does induce a bit of error because of some assumptions and simplifications made, it does yield reasonably accurate results and importantly, allows the current through an element to be displayed with reference to the voltage across it. As we've learned in previous lectures, relative phase shift between voltage and current is an extremely important property and this simple technique allows a technician to experimentally obtain this data. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell you lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.